We're now for our final panel. We're moving on to the very important issue of Belt and Road. And China, as you know, has described the Belt and Road Initiative as helping to usher in a new era, era of globalization. The private sector globally has shown enormous interest in getting involved in the project. Uh, and there's no doubt about the desperate need for infrastructure in developing Asia. However, views on the Belt and Road have turned negative following the debt trap in which Sri Lanka found itself and the decision of the new Malaysian government to suspend $22 billion of China-backed BRI projects. The US has been openly critical of, of the initiative and is rallying its traditional allies to offer an alternative. US Vice President Mike Pence spoke at the APEC summit uh, a week ago. He talked of loans where terms are often opaque at best uh, and projects that they support often being unsustainable and of poor quality. Too often, he said, they come with strings attached and lead to staggering debt. Very harsh words. The US, Japan, Australia and New Zealand unveiled at APEC a $1.7 billion plan to bring electricity and the internet to much of, of Papua New Guinea. This is widely seen as a, a countermeasure to Belt and Road. So, has the gloss worn off the vision of Belt and Road? And will China adjust its approach to projects in response to this pushback? Uh, and that's the subject of my panel now. I'm joined by Donald Kanak, Chairman of East Spring Investments, Gregory Hodkinson, Chairman of Arab, Professor Xiang Bing, Dean of the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, and Goi Sui Noi, who's China Bureau Chief of the Strait Times. Please welcome my guests. Thank you all. Now, Belton Road has come up in every conversation just about that we've had today. A huge uh, but very contentious issue. Uh, I'll start with you, Don. The politics have turned sour. Is this, uh, is this the wheels falling off the Belton Road Initiative? I, well, first of all, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with the politics turning sour. I think there's definitely criticism and there's definitely some well-deserved criticism, but I would think if you travel around, leave Singapore today and get on a plane and go to other parts of Asia. I mean, our business, by the way, East Spring Investments is the Asia asset management business of the Prudential. And the Prudential of the UK has been in this region for 90 years, and we're, the footprint's all over. So you go to Cambodia, you go to Laos, you go to Indonesia, and and, and test the waters there. You wouldn't hear it's become unpopular or it's con it, it, the wheels are falling off. So it's a Western it, construct. It, this. it is a, it is a, um, it, there are definitely issues and there are definitely problems and you pointed out some very good examples of very big projects that for reasons of unsustainability, whether that's fiscal unsustainability, their <coughs> environmental questions or whatever, have stumbled, have come and run into trouble. And I think there's, there are a lot of lessons to learn and a lot of things to, um, to take forward in terms of engaging, but I, would, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say the, the wheels have fallen off. I would say sort of in general, in a big picture sense, what I see uh, is not a, a conspiracy. There are, there are even theories out there, you know, well, these product projects are loaded with debt and then uh, the, the long-term plan is they fail and then there's a takeover. Um, that, I guess we could conceive that's a possibility, but I think it's much more likely if one looks at the way China has, we heard earlier the, the, from a couple of the speakers about, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Lee this morning, the way of competition is to move big and fast and, be, and make things happen quickly. That scale and speed when you take it outside of China, where you don't have this constant state of reform or ability to do mid-course correction, and you bring it into other countries, it's scale and speed is having some breakage. And I think that's the issue that needs to be dealt with. I think the concept of Belt and Road and the need for massive infrastructure financing and building in the region is, un, uh, is absolutely indisputable. Mm. Uh, Professor, I saw you nodding furiously there. So the, 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 the wheels haven't fallen off, which was my phrase, uh, but there might need to be some adjustments. Would that be your take on it? Well, before I make my remark, I would like to take a digression to echo some of the points I made earlier by Minister Chen. And uh, there's, a, it, there's a, so much focus on trade, but uh, I think another issue may warrant more attention is a neoliberalism started by Ms. Sacha in 1979 and then followed by President Reagan shaped the reform in China's fundamental way. 
the China-U.S. embraced neoliberalism better than any other country on Earth. Accordingly, you may consider China the most capitalist country on Earth. And because we don't have any decent social security whatsoever, we don't benchmark well against that of Russia. You know. So the challenge for the U.S. is what's next after neoliberalism. The challenge for China is more complex. Not only we have neoliberalism, but we have a state capitalism, which is a key concern to many Western countries. And for Europe, it's a matter of how do you compete with two major capitalist blocs, China and the US. They put a lot of pressure on it. Come back to the trade issue. You know, the Belt Road Initiative, initiative came uh, in a context of uh, change the China policy by the US. In Clinton time, is embrace China, uh, bring China into the WTO, make China a responsible stakeholder. Obama time was different, embrace China with a hedging strategy. So TPP, TTIP, and pivot to Asia. And then so China, I think Belt Road in, in, initiative could be part of the response by China. You know, not only the RCEP, not only the free trade zone in Shanghai, but also the Belt Road Initiative, you know, and it's uh, the difference in ideas, how do you reconfigure the global trading system? And uh, so this is a more broader context, you know. But if you look at the need for infrastructure, it's there, whether this region, you know, if you look at the experience of China, if you don't have roads, bridges, no possibility development. When you have roads, bridges, then we talk about something else, you know. Actually, the whole idea should be hugely welcome, regard whatever you say. You know, and, and uh, yes, uh, there, there's going to be some self-interest from China side, and uh, you know we do have huge experience in capacity experience. Because one time I remember, about 90% of global crane was concentrating in Pudong, 90% mm -hmm. global. So our experience, our scale, is um rivaled, unmatched by anyone. That experience should be shared globally. And also it's about time for Chinese companies to go global. You have IBM, GE, Siemens. Why Chinese companies should stay in China? <laughs> so it's about time. They need to go global. You know, one capability we have is infrastructure. You know? And then so, uh, uh, well, what about this debt stuff? And, and if you look at, you know, I. I the Chinese uh, foreign aid to Africa in 2018 represented about 2% of the total debt. 2%, 6 trillion US dollars, you know. They have a huge noise, pushback, criticism, all of that, you know. I grew up in China. Uh, when you criticize Chinese investment, well, why don't you pay attention to transparency, human rights, record of government? When I grew up, elementary school, I remember clearly, my teacher asked me to donate one cent a month for vaccination Africa children. I'm, I'm getting close to 60 years old. I was elementary school. So our folks in Africa, way beyond today, oil, stuff like that, okay. What I want to say is this. As a child, when you grew up in that environment, you were so helpless. Regardless of the human rights record of my government, you know, and I think I need to have access to roads, bridges, schools, hospitals. You know, it's very easy for you to talk about this. Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to share my experience in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, so I think the Minister Chen also has a point. Whenever you have a project, it's a deal between China and whatever nation you're talking about. You, you got to trust they have some decent level of procedures, you know, I mean processes, rationality, and the intelligence of making a judgment. And China also forgive many loans I don't know the precise number, you know. I mean, Venezuela, for example, how much money we invested? I mean, did Venezuela lose its solvency? I mean, we continue to extend more loans. A lot of, there's some claim, complaint even from China about extending too much loans to that particular country. But we are heavily criticized by the US yeah. at the same time, you know. Sometimes ironic, you know. Anyway, that's my two cents. Okay. Yes. But, but, Mario, <laughs> I'll, I'll come to you. The, <laughs> certainly in the Western, there's, resistance to Belt and Road, and there's growing resistance, led largely by the US. Is this going to thwart, delay the project, or as I said, you know, end it potentially, or is this a bump in the road? I think it's a bump. Um, I, I think it's a bump. And, uh, you know, I, my, my reason for saying that is that um, 
you know, you need to, to think about two things. One is the demand for infrastructure, which um, far outstrips the capacity of governments to uh, be able to pay for it uh, currently. And so it's going to need as many hands to the pump as possible to provide the infrastructure that's necessary uh, to keep up with the rate of population growth and urbanization across the countries of the Belt and Road. Uh, and, you know, the MDBs uh, agree that the demand is a couple of trillion per annum mm -hmm. between now and pick a date, 2035, mm -hmm. something like that. And they can only see where they could maybe muster about a half of that from, um, from governments, and that includes the Chinese government. So the demand is there. Uh, and the demand is going to need as much supply as it can get and probably won't be fully met. Uh, and, and therefore, keeping China out of the game, you know, is just not realistic. So that's one thing. The second thing to think of is, um, you know, so Ch China has built this capacity over the last 40 years uh, to plan and design and construct Infrastructure, but the point is not, you know, infrastructure isn't a thing unto itself. The point of infrastructure is it's there to stimulate and support economic and, and social development. And the 800 million people who have been lifted out of poverty in China in the last 40 years have been as a result of carefully planned, strategically planned infrastructure, which has underpinned then economic, uh, <coughs> economic development. So it's an essential... It's an essential uh, component of uh, economic development. Uh, now, the Chinese have built that capacity and they've got it to the point where the basic civil infrastructure of the country is largely built out, you know, 85% maybe. I mean, the high-speed rail network is nearly complete and so on and so forth. Their power network is largely complete and, and so forth. And it would just be completely economically wasteful to take that capacity and bin it. In other words, it needs to be deployed uh, where, where demand is. So I think we should call the elephant in the room about, about the, you know, the bump in the road. It's geopolitics. It's, mm. not, it's, not, um, <coughs> it's, it's not quality concern. It's not debt trap. It's geopolitics. Uh, has the execution been clumsy by the, on the Chinese side in some places? Yes. Um, you know, have, have recipient countries irresponsibly uh, asked for, you know, uh, projects that they can't afford to pay down the debt of? Yes. But does that mean the whole program is, is, uh, is, is questionable? Uh, no. Because we know you're China Bureau Chief and you've got a long history of reporting out of China. Do you pick up anything in, in, in Beijing that the China has recognised that these bumps in the road might require them to adjust their position in how they approach Belt and Road projects with neighbouring countries? Um, well, not Belt and Road per se, but um, uh, last year I, I attended a forum in Yunnan and what came out of it was that a sense that the Chinese do recognize that there are problems with the projects in these uh, in host countries. Um, the, there's some unhappiness over the way these projects are managed. Mm -hmm. For example, um, the Chinese bring an entire production chain mm -hmm. to these countries. So you have uh, the even down to the cooks and cleaners. Yes. And so the sense is that um, the local community does not have a share of, uh, of this economic activity. The local communities do not um, benefit from it. So, um, and culturally also, it's, it's how the, the, the Chinese um, uh, deal with the local, so um, there is a recognition that uh, the Chinese need to change the way 
that they manage these projects. Yeah. And yeah, no, no, that's good. No, go and and uh, do you see do you see real do you, do you see policy shifts or leadership saying this is how we need to do things? Do you see examples on the horizon of where uh, you know, there might be some test cases in projects? I think uh, that may be some time in coming. Yeah. Um, they are recognizing it, but uh, changing that culture is not going to be easy. And, and this, this is the point um, that was brought up by um, a former prime minister of Kyrgyzstan. And um, he, he saw this problem of um, how China, in its 5,000 years of statehood, has been looking inwards, right? It, it doesn't look out. And this is the first time that China is going out in a big way internationally, and it has a lot to learn uh, how it, um, <coughs> it needs to understand local culture, how it needs to uh, interact with people on the ground. And I think this, this shift will be some time in coming. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I follow up on that point. Yes, sir, sir. And, and uh, I know the enterprise in China fairly well. I did training for state-owned enterprises. One day, my uh, Western counterparts criticized China and industrial policy. I said, well, you know, Japan has it, Korean has it, you know. Uh, what's wrong with China? I mean, Germany has one. And as well, that's because you have uh, state-owned enterprises play a key role in that. I said, oh my God. That could be a plus, that could be a minus, depends on where you look at it. You look at early time, China's reform. You know, we want to be export driven. Well, the government wanted the SOE, state owned enterprise, to play a key role in the whole process. You know, some succeeded, most failed. Why? Individually, they, they, they become super rich. They bought huge houses in San Francisco, Vancouver. The company went bankrupt. <laughs> You know, so sometimes, you know, the, the strategy looking awfully good, you know, but, but execution level, different story. So using SOE to drive whether it's 2020 manufacturing or belt road, there's a plus, easier to coordinate. And uh, then th there's a high risk uh, in that regard as well. I think some of the concerns definitely overstated, you know. Some of the concerns overstated. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, building on that, that the, there's a good... There's a concept, there's a need, there's a capacity, there's an incredible amount of experience of eliminating poverty for hundreds of millions of people in a very short period of time. But even in China, there was breakage along the way, tremendous environmental consequences, sometimes bad debt problems, sometimes execution issues. So recognizing that, I mean, what's the right response? And I think there are some things going on which suggest there's a way through this. I mean, you said China's conscious, they may not have be ready to change. No, would change, no country changes its culture. But in going out, one of the most basic needs is to have standards and to recognize standards. And I think if you look at, I mean, Greg and I were, I guess last December was the UK economic financial dialogue is going on in, uh, in, in Beijing. And um, I was, there, there was a, a PBOC, Bank of England uh, program, it can t there's still work going on, green finance or whatever, to set standards of sustainability around the Belt and Road. So uh, multilateral development banks can play a role in this. But one of the most basic things is the engagement, you know, standing on the sidelines and criticizing isn't going to make it better. So how do you get engaged, whether it's pri private, public sector, to set standards of sustainable environmental standards, economic sustainability, the local, how to deal with local and get local consent? the transparency necessary to avoid corruption. Those are things that, um, you know, getting those set and, and the training necessary to be able to execute better, there is hope, I think, if, if we can continue that kind of engagement and China uh, takes, that, uh, takes that on board. Gregory, you're actively involved, so Arab's actively involved in a lot of these projects and standards is an issue that comes up fairly consistently, along with debt, but standards certainly. Do you see progress being made in internationalizing the standards of some of the projects? Um, well, I, I think um, using the term standards actually is a little bit misleading uh, because, um, because, because we have to define what we mean by standards. If we're talking about technical standards, you know, the Chinese trains run on time, you know, the fire safety standards are good, you know, people get out of buildings in a fire, they 
you know, the, um, the infrastructure works, you know, uh, you know, their technical standards are very good. Um, so it's not a question of that. Uh, it's rather a question of, uh, of, of investability. So sufficient transparency so that we can bring market forces to bear to make up that gap between the one trillion and the two trillion uh, US dollars a year demand that there is for in infrastructure is going to need private uh, sector investment and in large amounts. Yes. Uh, and beyond project by project by project, we really need to develop uh, infrastructure as an asset class in order, in order to make it investable. For it to be investable, uh, you know, uh, investors need to be able to see that they can get their money in, they can get their money out. There's a level playing field, there's transparency, there's liquidity, all these things that, that, um, that financial markets need to be able to invest. So the people need the infrastructure, the infrastructure needs the money, the money will drive, uh, you can call that standards if you want to, but I think it's misleading because we, we're divided by a common language there when the when the West says standards to the Chinese, the Chinese think we're talking about, you know, their technical standards, you know, their operational standards, and we're not. We're talking about investability, really. So uh, I think we should we should change that uh, change that language, and I think ultimately, if we do, uh, uh, and this is where I think uh, Western. Um, uh, Western institutions, Western companies have a contribution to be able to make because it's true the Chinese have done their infrastructure development in a very short space of time, you know, one generation, less than one generation. I mean, you know, I worked on projects in, in China in the 1980s, um, which were the very first, you know, wave of, um, and, you know, and they invited foreign capital in to... Uh, to help those infra very early infrastructure projects happen, toll roads and uh, power stations and the, and the like, which were the first, and then a wave of hotels so that you know, foreigners could come and they'd have a place to stay. It was all very planned. So the, the, the Chinese experience has been, A, very quick, you know, very large. Of course, there have been failures along the way. By the way, in the West, we had tremendous failures. You know, we just did it a little time ago. Uh, but we had all kinds of things that went wrong in the West as we developed our infrastructure in, in Britain and in, 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 in North America, all, all over the West. So uh, China's not unique in this. They've just done it quickly and, and, uh, and at large scale. What we've got to offer, though, is uh, 50 years, 80 years, 100 years, 200 years in some cases of, of uh, company experience working in the third countries in which you know these Belt and Road projects are are happening. So, what I think we've got to be able to offer to the Belt and Road program is uh, okay. the knowledge of how things work in the third countries, the understanding that third countries don't operate the way that China does. Uh, I wish they did in many respects. I mean, the strategic planning that uh, there is in China is one of the things that that's allowed it to. Uh, to pull those 800 million people out of poverty, poverty as quickly as they have. But if we work together, we, we can make it a success. I'm quite convinced about that. And I think, you know, it's a pendulum thing. There might be some bumps, but ultimately it's like trying to stop gravity. You won't be able to stop it. The demand is just uh, too great. Mobilising private capital, though, is a big mm. part of this. Is Developing capital markets has to be part of the answer of financing some of these projects, does it not? Yes. Um, when you took, take the trillions that are projected, you can look at uh, McKinsey's, PwC's, whatever projections, you're talking about so much financing that's needed. Um, for the countries that need this the most to finance that, it wouldn't be responsible. We're going to be having another problem discussion here in another year or two if it's too much is financed by cross-currency, foreign currency debt. And so the long-term way to, to build sustainable finance in most of these countries, which have high savings rates. It's interesting, you look around ASEAN, you see there's, there's very high savings rates, but the money typically isn't mobilized into long-term investment. And so the way to match the need for infrastructure and the need for uh, sustainable you know, 
financing of that is to build up the local capital markets. Uh, and, the, and the scale is, is staggering. If you look at um, it, just across you know, the, the ASEAN region, um, Singapore, we, we all know. Infrastructure is built, financial capital markets are there. If you look at you know, insurance, pension, and mutual fund assets as a percent of GDP, it's over 100%. But you go to the other extreme and go to Indonesia, it's 9%. So the mobilization, how, how to finance it. Indonesia already is feeling, I think, some burden of f too much foreign debt. Yes. So that's a big part of it. The other, just to mention, I think it will, there will be un, maybe unintended good consequences of financing more infrastructure using bonds, equities, et cetera, and that's around the transparency. What Greg was saying is that if, if by having to subject a project to the scrutiny of a rating agency or a, having to build a prospectus and take it out to investors, a great amount of transparency will come on to the financing of the project and who's behind it and the qualifications and the risk mitigation. And that will go a long way toward making what any kind of infrastructure, whether it's Belt and Road or, or a one that, that's not Belt and Road, a better project. Yeah. I just want well, to say one thing about that specific point. Um, and uh, I, I don't disagree with Minister Chan very often, and maybe he just didn't complete the thought, but, but there is an important point that relates directly to what Donald just said, and that is that uh, not all infrastructure has an immediate, an immediate market payback. Mm. Uh, you know, there's infrastructure that can be paid for on the basis of uh, user charges one way or another, you know, real or virtual, but um, much infrastructure, uh, particularly in developing countries, or less developed countries, let's say, much infrastructure has a social as well as economic uh, purpose. And, and finding a market me mechanism to get your money back from that, you know, requires kind of synthetic products or some, you know, some quite sophisticated um, approach. Uh, you know, traditionally, this is where the public sector steps in and, and, and yeah. finances it as public good. So, you know, when, when Minister Chan this morning said, you know, the market is the way to, uh, to, 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 to cut through, to, to iron out the bumps, I mean, I completely agree with that, but we also need a mecha mechanism to be able to recognise that uh, other infrastructure, vitally important social and economic infrastructure, has a very long-term and very diffuse uh, set of benefits. And it's not immediately obvious how those can be directly harnessed in a, you know, get your money in, get your money out yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Okay. So let me open up to questions now from the audience too. We'll, we'll come to you, Professor, but let's open it up. Uh, just identify yourself, please name an organisation. Uh, well, I'll start with uh, Martin, then I'll come to my chairman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, Martin Barrow, the Jardine Masson Group. Does the panel think that BRI can enhance the importance and relevance of the travel and tourism sector with all the infrastructure developments and so across the world, that sector often gets underestimated of its export value and its contribution. How can that play a role? Well, there are 130 million Chinese traveling abroad already. I'm very positive we'll do a great job in promoting tourism. <laughs> I'm very positive. I don't have a number for that. <laughs> Well, and, and as well, um, you know, when the Belt and Road Initiative was launched by President Xi Jinping five years ago, you know, he said that there were five, it had five purposes. It wasn't an infrastructure project as such, but the fifth purpose, and maybe the most important, is, is to encourage people-to-people -people bonds. And, you know, those people-to-people -people bonds arise from people traveling and, and, and meeting each other. And I think that's a very important you know, that's a very important point, and it goes to the business of should we be trying to, you know, from the West contain China, which we heard this morning, you know, I don't think that's very sensible. Uh, you know, China's determined to continue to open up, uh, which has got to be good, hasn't it? I mean, it's got to be good, and um, got to be good for all of us. Uh, and a very important part of that is is the people-to-people -people bonds. You know, we, we understand it, we begin to understand each other and, and tourism and travelling is a, a means to that end. Actually, a saying by Deng Xiaoping, the liberation of thoughts, when people get an opportunity to see 
how Singapore and Hong Kong e are functioning. That's far more important than foreign aid. It, that's very important. We have a road bridges, people travel. People, they see things differently. The good things will come <laughs> later. Stephen. And then we'll come over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a slightly awkward question. Um, Greg Hodkinson, in describing some of the bumps on the road, um, I think quite rightly referred to them being essentially technical um, implementation, financing and investment. Um, and, and he said, um, and you can correct me if I've misconceived um, the point, um, that the, the only real obstacle, the only more fundamental obstacle was geopolitics, uh, which rather Im could be held to imply that if only you just get the politicians out of the way, this will all be fine. But every, anyone who goes to India will know that there's very considerable nervousness in India about the Belt Road Initiative and a sense of potential encirclement. Now, India is either already or about to be the largest country in the world, not economically, of course, but by population. And any perspective on the latter part of this century would suggest that China is not only ha going to have to work closely with America, which is, it takes two to tango, I fully recognize that, but also to work closely with India. And I pose, therefore, the question of whether the um, the way in which the Belt Road Initiative is being talked about and implemented is sensitive enough to the concerns that are very tangible in the atmosphere in India. Ask each of you that. We'll start with you, Professor. Well, uh, definitely, I don't think China will view India as a key competitor now, at least. Uh, that's not true. But definitely, uh, India is on a rise to become the you know, country with large population. If you look at the capability of Chinese companies, you know, which has been sort of a, among the best in leveraging low-cost labor, India will have all of that. I think the Chinese capability were flagging well in that in that regard. There's a lot of synergies. Uh, there's uh, you know there's a, a good uh, uh, reason for collaboration between the two nations. You know, uh, you know to me, I, I don't think the Belt Road Initiative really targeting. India. I think there's some sort of uh, arm twisting between China and US in trying to reconfigure the global trading system, but not targeting India for sure. That's my, that's my two cents. But don't there are clearly concerns in India. Uh, is, is that, does China have to grapple with that and deal with that? I think China and India will continue to have to engage on a whole range of trade and opening issues. Our, our conversations in the last 10 years tend in the international conferences like this tend to be the West and China. But if you, if you go to some of the big international conferences in China now, go to the Boal Forum, you'll see that some of the most interesting tangles are now occurring. The, 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 the Westerners aren't involved on the panel. It's between India and China, the two biggest countries in the world. And historically, if we go back a few hundred years, the two dominant economies of the world for a great period of human civilization. So I, I think what Stephen's raising is a very important point. I, don't, I think Belt and Road is a piece of a very, very uh, big economic puzzle that needs to be sorted out. And I think the main actors in sorting that out will be India and China. Guess who I, OK, um, we, maybe we should look at Japan and its attitude towards Belt and Road through, through the years. Um, it did not want to participate in it at all. But uh, it's come round to recognizing the um, importance of, of this project. And uh, it has said that it, it will take part in Belt and Road uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And the whole idea is to, um, going back to standards, to raise the standards of the projects. And OK, there's also that uh, competition with China. There's the rivalry. So Japan has um, uh, also uh, cooperated with Japan uh, with with India, what they call the uh, Asia Africa Growth Corridor, right? So um, powers in the region will always view Belt and Road with with some wariness about 
China trying to expand its influence in the region. And, and there is some amount of truth in that. I mean, you look at Xi Jinping and his 19th Party, uh, Party Congress speech, he talked about China moving uh, closer to the center stage of the world. He talks about uh, China contributing to, to mankind through projects like Belt and Road. So, um, I guess uh, in, in the broader scheme of things, Belt and Road is good for the region. And uh, there are a lot of benefits to be had economically uh, for countries, organizations, and governments, uh, and companies uh, taking part in it. Yeah, provided, uh, of course, um, we have what is called, uh, what uh, Mr. Chan this morning talked about as uh, market discipline, yeah. right? So I don't think India should view Belt and Road as something that threatens it. Um, there is rivalry between the two countries. They are, they are the biggest powers in the region. But um, there are benefits to be had. And China, of course, needs to explain itself more, I think, mm. uh, about uh, its intentions, right? And, and build more trust with, with its neighboring countries where this, where this project is concerned. But um, yeah, I don't think powers should fear, in the region should fear, but Gregory, that India question is one because there is huge resistance in, in India. Japan has softened its line. Yes. Absolutely. Do you see India doing the same? Well, you know, I was, I was sitting here thinking, well, what do I know? You know, I'm a consulting engineer, really. Um, <laughs> but then I thought, um, I'm the same age as Xi Jinping, and he's also an engineer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we're both Geminis. <laughs> so, so you're an expert, please. We... So, you know, why not? <laughs> okay. You know, there are very real geopolitics at play, of course, uh, Stephen. And um, it's, it's, it's a question of how you interpret what's happening. Uh, so, you know... The, you know, the, in the West, we, we, we've got, what, 10% of the population of the planet, and we've, we've basically controlled it for the last couple of hundred years, or certainly had, you know, way more than our fair share of the pie, if you can think about the world that way. And, uh, and that's changed. You know, the re-emergence of China onto the world scene, which, um, you know, in the Chinese view is is a re-emergence, remembering that it was well uh, on the world scene, you know, until the first quarter of the 15th century. The re-emergence of China on the world scene at the rate at which it's re-emerged is, is like another sun entering the solar system. Mm. And you can't do that without there being consequences, you know, gravity changes. And, uh, and, that's, and we're seeing that all play out. But in this day and age, uh, with all that we ha have at risk and, and all that we have at our disposal, uh, it would be folly, I think, for all of us to, to take a zero-sum view of this and, and just short-termism to, th to think that you know, it, it, it can be encircled and resisted. At, at the very best, it might be slowed down a little bit, but wouldn't it be better to engage? Always must be better to engage and, and, and to talk. You know, I mean, personally, I mean, what do I know? Do I, th do I think the Chinese are trying to encircle India with, you know, their Pakistan, uh, you know, route into the Belt and Road? No, I don't. Uh, I don't think that, but I could be wrong. Final question there. Lady over here, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, panel. Excellent discussion. I'm, I'm a research analyst. I was born in London, but the last 15 years I'm working in Central Asia and Singapore and other <coughs> places. 
Um, my specialism, my field of research is geopolitics, and I'm enjoying this last discussion very much. I'm also turning over the key words that we've heard since this morning, um, Chan Chung Singh talking about excellence and quality. Um, shortly after that, uh, I was hearing remarks about collaboration and communication and using AI to reach across borders. Uh, our friend at, at Ripple talking about organizational culture working together. Um, I'm hearing uh, Kai Fu Lee talking about the success of the relentless entrepreneur, single-minded. What I'm drawing from this is a, is a divergence of views, competition or collaboration. So as we look at the problem space that you've just sketched and one considers all the failed models that we've seen the last hundred years, pivot, heartland, axis, convergence, divergence, world stage, re-emergence, What's coming next, in the next 50 years? What new language can we come up with? Um, would the panel care to comment on, do they see this being a new global order that's around competition, collaboration, or perhaps adaptation? Thank you. Okay, is the new global order competition, collaboration, or well, adaptation? Well, to me, the may be the first time in human history we have so many <coughs> transformative changes concentrating one point in time. I talk about development models, reconfiguration, global trading system, disruptive technology, the political system, social contract, deep trouble, the global governance, sustainability, whatever, and collecting my myopia humanity. So if you're taking all this change together, despite a huge disparity between China, US, and any, many other major powers, I think the collaboration is the only way forward. And, and the, the best time, the worst of times, if you don't collaborate, it will be the worst of times. You can have any excuses. <laughs> the only way moving forward is collaboration. Be positive, be constructive. Always construct. Let's fix the problem, if there is a problem. Sit down, fix the problem. So vote That's for collaboration I, here. <laughs> um, I, I, do you eat or do you breathe? <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, collaboration or competition, uh, co-opetition, you know, I, it's going to be both, right? We would be naive to say it's one or the other. I think what's most important right now, engage, be positive, and, and deal with problems. I think that's very constructive advice. We, if Someone very wise once said to me, you can't talk your way out of a problem you behaved yourself into. So just more talking and explaining isn't going to do it. It's going to take a matter of actually dealing with these issues, reducing risk in projects, making them more sustainable. Um, and, and we uh, discussions this morning around the, the rules of engagement and trade, the, the, the f creating a, a, at least the feeling again that competition is on a, enough of a level playing field that we can collaborate. I think that's, I think part of the issue right now is some of the systems that you know, Greg alluded to the fact that the 10% has been um, benefiting, but the, the system that the, came out of World War II is, and in the next 20, 30 years has, is now experiencing some creaking and grinding, and it needs to be adjusted. And if it can be adjusted uh, proactively um, and a sense of fairness um, exists enough, then I think collaboration is the way forward, and competition can be fair. Yes, we know. Well, I agree about collaboration. And the point that, yeah, you, you cannot get away from competition. Um, the main thing is to put aside your differences. I think the Chinese have always said this, that uh, or going back to Teng, uh, setting aside our differences and let's come and cooperate on issues that we can cooperate on. And yeah, basically that. Hey, Greg, we find a word to you. Um, well, I think, I think business has a really important role um, in this, you know, the nation states, have, you know, has, has a lot to answer for. Um, and business can be a force for good because, you know, in my business, we've got operations in 50 countries and, and we don't, you know, we don't, uh, we don't compartmentalize, uh, you know, our colleagues. We, you know, we operate as one entity. We're very well connected technologically uh, on one system, you know, over the whole, and this is, this is where, you know, this is where information technology is really, really helpful. Um, but business, I think, is a, is, a, is a force for reason and a force for good. 
and uh, and I think, you know, I would hope that uh, that that business rises to the occasion and and uh, and and is a force towards collaborating rather than the opposite. Tremendous. I'm afraid we have to leave it there. We're out of time. Um, thank you all very much. Again, fantastic and such discussion. That ends the panel and ends our conference today. Uh, thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you very much to our, our sponsors, Arab Prudential, ABP, and also Straits Times, our, our media partner. Uh, thank you to the Asia House team for doing such a great job putting this together. Uh, and thank you to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being involved. Thanks for being engaged. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. Please join us for lunch outside. Have a good day.